So uh, welcome everyone to the GIS Sea Level Rise Seminar. Um, we're very glad to have Dr. Mike Bruteau. Uh, he's a research geophysicist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And his research focuses on improvements to the spatial and temporal recovery of Earth's time variable gravity field with special attention to cryospheric and hydrologic surface mass balance signals, uh, surface mass signals, as well as changes in the solid earth. And uh, his work primarily focuses on GRACE and GRACE follow-on processing analysis applications and combinations with other satellite and earth-based observing systems and covers both theoretical and practical uh, advances in satellite gravimetry and altimetry processing and use. Uh, Dr. Cruteau earned his MS and PhD in aerospace engineering sciences from CU Boulder and his master's in education from the University of Notre Dame and uh, bachelor's in aerospace engineering from the University of Notre Dame also. And uh, he will be speaking today on the topic, uh, recent misclosure in the sea level budget. So uh, welcome. Mike. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, I'm going to give a forewarning to everybody that my dog is sitting right behind me and uh, he likes to chime in from time to time. So apologies in advance. Uh, but thank you for inviting me today. Very excited to give this talk. Um, and I will put the big caveat at the beginning that my talk is going to walk through the sea level budget and the, and the portions of it and talk about the different data sets involved and talk about this misclosure that we're seeing. Um, but I will not be saying that we've solved anything. Uh, so this is a, an, an open item that I'm gonna be talking about. And so hopefully, um, perhaps somebody on this call is eager to participate in trying to solve this open item with the different science teams involved. Um, and then I just wanna real quick give a quick thank you to Bryant Loomis and Brian Beckley, both from my lab at Goddard uh, for their help in putting this talk together. And this picture here was from the Chesapeake Bay program. So thanks to them for letting me use this photo. Uh, but this was from flooding in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, and it is just one of the many examples of the reasons why we need to make sure that we have a proper accounting for sea level rise. Okay, so as a quick overview of the presentation, um, we're gonna kind of talk about this in four parts. The first three parts are the three pieces of what will become the sea level budget, uh, the 30 plus years of satellite altimetry, um, the ocean mass estimates that we can get from GRACE and GRACE follow-on, and then ocean density and what that means for steric sea level uh, from the Argo floats. And when you put those together, you have the sea level budget, which we'll talk about how it has been in and out of balance over the past, say, 15 years and where it's at now. Just as a quick cartoon, uh, the sea level budget really is talking about the pluses and minuses that go into what ultimately becomes the height of the oceans. And so these are things like mass from mountain glaciers, Antarctic ice sheet, Greenland ice sheet, uh, and even water that comes out of terrestrial water storage and from the land. Um, it's also the steric expansion of sea level. So just like the mercury in the thermometer, if you heat the thermometer, the mercury rises. If you heat the oceans, the oceans rise, uh, which give us kind of a really nice relationship that if we can measure the total height, which we do with altimetry, uh, then that's going to equal the water that is being added, so the mass gain from grace, plus the steric expansion that we can measure with Argo. So let's talk about the 30 years of altimetry. And I'll actually caveat this with, on my next slide, we're going to immediately see it's more than 30 years of altimetry. Um, but we're specifically going to focus today on the time frame with Topex Poseidon at the start, moving forward to what we have now with Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich. And so in this video, uh, we're first seeing uh, altimetry that we could get from the CSAT mission. And as you'll see, this was in the late 70s. As we move forward in time, there were many different advances in what we could do with satellite altimetry. So this first advances with GeoSat, you see uh, kind of a marked increase in the uh, 
in the spatial recoverability of ocean change, um, but still not to the extent that we can uh, get a good global estimate of global mean sea level. But moving forward, beginning in 1992, the Topex Poseidon mission launched as well as ERS missions. And then uh, this time series was carried forward with the Jason 1, 2, and 3 missions, as well as now Sentinel-6 Michael Fry, like I alluded to earlier. We have a very increased spatial uh, resolution in the altimetry data sets. And then just in this past year, the SWAT mission has launched, which uh, this is kind of just a computer rendering of what the uh, what the spatial variability will be able to recover with it is, as it's still very new. Um, but as you can see, that is getting better and better by the day. Now, what this means is that since about 1992, we have this nice global data set um, that can tell us something about the oceans. And so uh, just a little bit of information about that data set. It begins with Topex Poseidon um, and then continues through with its successor missions What's nice about these missions is that they all follow the same roughly 10-day repeat orbit. It's in a 66-degree inclination and at an altitude of about 1,300, 1,350 kilometers. Um, and this mission is able to achieve precise orbit determination orbit heights to within a centimeter and sea level estimates to better than five centimeters. And uh, with the more recent missions, it can do even better than that. Like I said, it was launched in 92. Topix Poseidon gave us about 13 years of data and then was followed by Jason 1 in December 2001, OSTM, which is the Ocean Surface Topography Mission, or Jason 2 in June 2008, then Jason 3 in 2016, and Sentinel 6 Michael Freilich just a few years ago. Now, what I don't show here on this particular plot is that uh, we were actually able to achieve overlap between all of these missions. And so when Jason-1 launched, Topex Poseidon was still functioning. And so for the beginning of Jason-1, uh, it was initially flown directly behind the Topex Poseidon mission, offset by some amount of distance. And then that way they could observe the exact same uh, measurements along the exact same orbits for a period of about six months. Uh, and they used that time to then make sure that there weren't any type of biases or any type of uh, different offsets that needed to be accounted for between the two different missions before Jason-1 then took over as the nominal mission uh, providing the science data and Topix Poseidon was able to move elsewhere. They then did the same thing with Jason-2, Jason-3, and then Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich. And it was just within the last couple of years that Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich took over from Jason-3 as the nominal mission, even though both are still flying. Let's see. Okay. Um, as I said, this is on a 10-day repeat ground track. And so here is what that track looks like. This was from Topix Poseidon Cycle 110, which was way back in 1995. Um, and from this depiction, you can also see the sea level anomaly measurement that is coming out of the Topex Poseidon mission. Uh, and you can see that, you know, by and large, this is pretty small measurements that are taking place, but there are some kind of hot spots throughout. Um, and we've essentially had this map for every 10-day cycle beginning in, I think, October of 1992, all the way to the present day. Um, you can tell that there are some places, uh, obviously, where land is that this mission is not measuring, but also where there's sea ice, and then kind of in and around some different islands and various other things that have caused a few small gaps in the data set. Um, but by and large, we have extremely good coverage over the major oceans every 10 days. Okay, so that first brings us to the first equation of the day, the sea level equation. And you might think that the sea level equation is something as simple as this, uh, that the sea level anomaly is simply the altitude of the satellite. And then the satellite bounces a radar off of the water to measure the distance between the satellite and the water. Um, and so you would say, OK, if we subtract those two numbers, then we get the sea surface height, basically the difference between the altitude and the range there. However, this actually overlooks a lot of important factors. There's the tropospheric corrections. There's the ionospheric correction, the dynamic atmosphere correction various earth tides, so solid earth, ocean tides, load tides, pole tides, 
C-state bias, which is due to primarily the wave roughness. There's a mean C-state that we typically subtract out in order to be kind of our reference starting point. Then there's a frame offset, as well as glacial isostatic adjustment. Um, and so this very simple computation, which was primarily a POD problem, precise orbit determination problem, actually becomes a much bigger problem involving many, many fields of expertise. Uh, and as a result, the Ocean Surface Topography Science Team, which has kind of spearheaded all of this effort, uh, really is composed of experts from throughout these different disciplines. Um, and I don't know that there's any one person or even any one lab that could claim uh, expertise over all of these things. It really is an international effort. Now, if you take that data set, you can then compute global mean sea level, GMSL, from altimetry. And you can do that either by computing the mean of the long track measurements that I showed before, or uh, there are sometimes some gridded products that take those long track measurements and put them onto the ocean in a grid, and you can compute the mean from that. I want to highlight here that there's a really nice tool, the Radar Altimetry Database System, known as RADS, uh, that really helps to streamline this computation. It is free and open source. We use it in our lab, although we don't use it exclusively. We actually have multiple methods of computing this. Um, and uh, in between each mission, like I was talking about before, one of the important parts of this processing is you want to make sure that as you transition from, say, JSON 1 to JSON 2, you have properly adjusted for any type of intermission biases there. And so just to give you an idea of what this looks like, uh, this is sea level from Topex way at the beginning all the way until late in the JSON-3 mission. I don't have Sentinel-6 on this particular plot, but this is more just an illustrative plot. Um, and we can see here in the three highlighted circles, the overlap portions of that six month or sometimes longer period uh, where the two different missions were flying with one another uh, in succession and therefore should be measuring exactly the same thing. Um, and so there is all kinds of calculations involved in trying to get these biases between the missions correct. But even after you do that, you can see that there are still some very small biases that sometimes need to be uh, adjusted for at the very end of this. Um, and so as an example of what this might look like, you would take a curve like this and slightly adjust it. And I'll go back again. It doesn't make much of a difference, but it does make a small difference. Now, one thing I want to highlight here is this uh, part where I say no overlap. With the Topex Poseidon mission, there came a period right towards the end of the big El Nino in the late 90s, uh, where side A, the side A radar instrument on Topex, um, was no longer working as we intended it to. And so it was switched over to its completely redundant side B radar system. Now, as a result of that, there is no overlap period between these two side A and side B data sets. And so there has been a whole concerted effort by many, many people in trying to make sure that we don't have some type of bias here. And when you look at the data set, you almost think there has to be something going on here. But you also have to keep in mind this was during that El Nino period. Uh, right towards the end of it. And so it, just looking at the data set is not necessarily um, going to tell you that it is or isn't with bias. Um, and it really involves a much more detailed look than that. The other thing I'll note is that this plot here and the next plot uh, include what is a very obvious annual signal. And pretty much from here on out, I'm going to be removing that signal and then also uh, smoothing the data sets, because primarily what we're looking at in today's talk is a divergence in the trends of the different components in the sea level budget. Uh, and so these annual parts are just generally not going to appear in the remaining uh, portions of the talk. Okay, um, now that we kind of have an idea of how this gets computed, if you wanted to go and grab this yourself and work on something related to the global mean sea level curve, there are lots of places you could do it. Um, I saw people from a number of these institutions on the call, so they're probably already familiar with it. Uh, but here I have uh, literally pulled right off of the website the global mean sea level curve from sealevel.nasa.gov. This curve is actually computed by Brian Beckley, who, as I mentioned at the beginning, was one of the folks that helped me put this talk together. Um, and uh, you can either grab a plot or you can grab the data set itself if you want to work with this data set.
Moving on to the next portion of the sea level budget, I want to talk about ocean mass from GRACE and GRACE follow-on. And this is really where uh, I like to say the weight of climate change is coming into effect in the oceans. This is what it's measuring. It's measuring the mass gains in the oceans. And so as a quick overview of the GRACE and GRACE follow-on missions, um, GRACE stands for the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. It launched in 2002 and flew until mid-2017. It then had a successor mission, GRACE follow-on, which launched 11 months later. And so there's an 11-month gap between the two missions. That's unfortunate because it means that we can't we can't know with uh, without any uncertainty that there's some type of offset between the missions. But as I'll talk about a little later, we think we're doing okay there. Um, there is then another mission planned. It, it, it is in phase A and has passed SRR. Um, and that probably will launch at the end of this decade or hopefully not get pushed until the next decade. Uh, but that will be a mission that with any luck will overlap with GRACE follow-on. Um, it's going to be close, we'll say. Um, these, these satellites so far, GRACE and GRACE follow-on, are in very similar orbits. They're pairs of satellites. Uh, they're in about a 500 kilometer orbit initially, although they are allowed to uh, decrease in the atmosphere. And so they have dropped, I believe GRACE follow-on is around like 480 or 490 right now. Grace dropped all the way into the 300s before eventually uh, really deorbiting and burning up. Like I said, they're a pair of satellites. So there's a leader satellite and a follower satellite. That kind of gets them the nickname of Tom and Jerry from time to time, where one is chasing the other at all times. And the satellites are separated by about 220 kilometers. Uh, to give you an idea of how far that is, that's the distance from like Seattle, Washington to Portland, Oregon. Now I point that out because the primary instrument on these satellites is a ranging device that doesn't point at the earth, but instead points between the two satellites. And with GRACE, that ranging instrument was a microwave radiometer and it could measure changes in the distance between those two satellites to something like 10 microns. So smaller than the thickness of your hair on a distance from Seattle to Portland. Um, and then with GRACE follow-on, they also fly that instrument, but they've added in the laser ranging interferometer. This is uh, an instrument that does something like 100 times better in its ranging performance um, and really is impressive in what it can get in that along track measurement. That's not the only instrument on GRACE, however. There's also accelerometers on board the satellites. Um, as GRACE is flying, it's trying to observe the gravity field but there are also non-gravitational forces that affect the orbit of the satellite. And so these accelerometers are on board to try and account for that, things like drag and solar radiation pressure. It has GPS receivers for satellite position, star cameras to be able to figure out the orientation of the satellite. And when you put this together, you end up with what kind of nominally has become its primary science data product, a monthly time variable gravity estimate that really is a unique data set in all of Earth science for capturing mass changes all across the planet in the oceans, the hydrosphere, cryosphere, and the solid Earth. Now, how do GRACE and GRACE follow-on work? Well, like I said, they're uh, in the same orbit and one is following the other. And as the two satellites are flying along, they have some nominal distance between them. Now, as they approach a mass anomaly, and in this cartoon on the left, that mass anomaly is just gonna be kind of a mountain island, the first satellite that approaches the mountain is accelerated forward by the extra mass of that mountain, or mass anomaly more generally. It's accelerated forward, the distance between the satellites increases, and then as it continues flying, the first satellite passes the mass anomaly, the second satellite gets closer to it, and so while the first one begins to slow down as it passes, the second one speeds up, eventually they both completely pass the mass anomaly and end up kind of back in their nominal uh, position, the same distance that they started with. At the bottom of this cartoon, you can kind of see how the, the interspacecraft distance in uh, between them adjusts over time as it passes the mass anomaly. Uh, as, as you pass over a large mass anomaly, that distance will increase for a positive anomaly and decrease for a negative anomaly. That then led to this uh, plot here, which kind of became the first famous plot of GRACE follow-on, the GRACE follow-on Himalaya plot. It was from a single ground track from very early on in the mission, May 30th, 2018. 
And what we can see here is what happens in the interspacecraft distance as the satellite initially flies over the Canadian archipelago, then North America into the Pacific Ocean, over Antarctica, the Indian Ocean, the Himalayas, and then continues north. And you can see with each of the major uh, mass anomalies that it flies over, a little bit of variability in this interspacecraft distance, with the key one happening here between points 9 and 10. So that would be right here over the Himalayas, where you can see the massive gravitational anomaly effect of the added mass over the Himalayas on this orbit. That then led to kind of the now, I suppose, famous quote that people say, instead of having a radar that points down at the ground or a laser that points down at the ground, um, and those being the instruments, instead the satellites themselves are the instruments. All right. From there, we can then talk about what the GRACE data products look like. Um, and it's important to note that GRACE and GRACE follow-on observe the total gravity field. And so when you're looking at the total gravity field, you have a map that kind of looks like this. And if you want to see how April differed from the rest of the gravity field, you would want to subtract the static gravity field. Now, the reason I point this out is that when we look at these two maps, you would be very hard pressed to see any differences between the two of them. And in fact, when you do that subtraction, the order of magnitude is significantly smaller in this difference plot than in these two first plots here. However, what we see here in the difference plot is a very coherent signal, something that would be a very obvious climate signal. So you can see there are mass anomalies in Greenland, in the Amazon basin, California, and so on and so forth, over here in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and so on. Um, I'll point out also that when you take one month of tracks from GRACE, you're able to compute something on the resolution of about 330 kilometers. Now that resolution is a single direction. So if you wanted like a spatial area, you'd say 330 by 330, something like 110,000 kilometers squared. Um, that's sometimes hard to grasp. So another way I like to put this is that GRACE can roughly see the size of Iowa uh, or maybe the mid-Atlantic for folks on the call. Um, and so you're not going to be able to tell the difference between, let's say, Washington, D.C. and Baltimore that are only 35 miles apart and only a few miles uh, wide. But you will be able to see something, the difference in, let's say, Iowa and its neighboring state of uh, Illinois. Now, the GRACE data products are now got more than a 20-year record. Um, so the first GRACE month was way back in April 2002. The latest month for GRACE, I believe, I saw a solution for possibly January or February of this year, um, and basically every month in between. There are a few gaps in the data set. During the GRACE mission, those gaps were caused just as the mission got older and older and got into its extended lifetime. The batteries started to degrade, and there were certain months where we just didn't have enough power in order to fly it, primarily due to the orientation with the sun. GRACE then uh, took its last measurements in June of 2017, and there was this 11-month gap before GRACE follow-on started, and we've been pretty much every month since. Um, I want to point this out just because this monthly product has really provided a lot of useful science, so unique observations of mass change in the ocean, hydrosphere, cryosphere, solid earth. Um, you can compute time series of regional change. You can compute maps of trends or seasonal variability or uh, climate indices or whatever you want. Uh, and you can take this data and you can assimilate it into models and other things to get higher resolution. There's lots of different levels of this data. Um, and I'll just go through this very quickly. Level 1B GRACE products are uh, where I have spent a lot of my time in trying to figure out how to squeeze extra information out of the GRACE signals. But these are those along track data products, uh, that, that inter-satellite measurement, uh, ranging measurement that I mentioned before. And really there's only a, a few processing centers that have all of the uh, software and expertise to be able to do the processing on these. So as a result, more user-focused products started to be developed and the level two products kind of became the nominal product. These are unconstrained spherical harmonics. And the big problem with this is this kind of came with an expert only tag. After a while, people realized that uh, this was something that required a lot of expertise to know how to use and know how to use well. And I'll show why in just a second. 
And so more user-focused products started to be developed. First, they took the sphericals, did a whole bunch of post-processing, put them onto grids, and uh, that was a really good step forward. And then a more recent regularized mass con idea has come about, which really has tried to create just works out of the box for users uh, to be able to use Grace Data. Um, then you could take it a step further, I suppose, and you could take Grace Data and just compute the ocean mass curve, for instance, and release just that curve itself. That might be something like a level four product. Now, to talk about the sphericals very briefly, um, and, and I focus a little more on Grace in this talk than the others, because this is really where most of my expertise has been, although I have been branching into the other topics. Um, spherical harmonics are basically a Fourier transform onto the surface of a sphere. Uh, and so it's a, it's a way of dividing up the gravity field into a whole bunch of individual components that then sum together to give you the total gravity field. Now, if you're not familiar with spherical harmonics, the one that you might actually know about, even if you didn't realize it, is this one in the, the middle of the second row, C20. This is the J2 term for Earth, Earth's oblateness, or some people call it the equatorial bulge. And this is basically the term that's describing how Earth is fatter at the equator than at the poles. Um, but you can see that there's all kinds of different spatial patterns that can be described by these spherical harmonics. When you sum them all up, you can get the uh, full gravity field. And the harmonics themselves are these two terms, this, the CLM term and the SLM term. And this T here is just to say that these are time varying. Like we talked about, there are monthly maps. And so we have a monthly estimate for each of these different terms. Um, up here, we also have a term that can determine the spatial resolution. And so typically with a GRACE spherical harmonic product, we want to look at a monthly solution, which basically limits us usually to about a degree in order 60 spherical harmonic expansion. That means we end up estimating about 3,700 terms, and we can get that 330 kilometer uh, resolution that I talked about before. More recently, some centers have been pushing this to 96. And in theory, we can get a resolution up to about 208 kilometers, although in practice, that's not actually true because we're still limited by what GRACE can actually observe in a month. If you wanted to do a static gravity field from GRACE, you could go to 200 degrees, you could go even higher, and that'll really bring your resolution to a smaller number. But the big problem why, uh, the big reason why this is kind of a problematic data set for non-experts is that when you first pull it and use it out of the box, you get a map that kind of looks like this. And when you look at this map, this doesn't look like anything that you maybe have ever seen outside of the GRACE mission. And it doesn't really look like a terribly useful piece of information. However, over time, there have been different ways to try and remove what became known as stripes in the GRACE data set, as well as various noise in the data set. And as you begin to use these kind of post-filtering uh, solutions and products, you can go from what was this kind of top left plot down to something here in the bottom middle, and you get a very nice coherent signal over the places where you would expect there to be a coherent signal. And so this is just for a single month, April 2003, and we have applied two different types of uh, noise reduction um, into getting this plot here. But in order to make things a lot easier for people, over time, a new product came available called a regularized mass con. And instead of using that spherical harmonic expansion over the globe, basically these mass con solutions said, let's just put a checkerboard across the earth or almost turn it into a soccer ball, we'll say. And we're gonna use uh, direct estimates from the long track measurements we talked about before to instead of measuring sorry, instead of estimating the spherical harmonic terms, estimate these individual checkerboard pieces. Now, one of the real benefits of doing this is that because you're now estimating spatial terms, you can bring in extra spatial information very easily into your estimation system. And we typically do this through regularization. The regularization could be anything from saying, okay, these mass cons are on land while these mass cons are over the ocean and therefore they shouldn't behave like one another. Land mass cons should all kind of behave similarly and ocean mass cons should all kind of behave similarly, but we wouldn't expect ocean and land to behave similarly. 
Um, there's lots of other things you can do with these types of regularizations as well. You could make it model dependent. You could try and bring in additional data sets. Um, and various centers have tried different things. Um, what's also nice about these is if you then want to compute ocean mass, or sorry, total mass for something like the Gulf of Alaska, you just add up all of these mass cons and you get a nice curve right away. You don't have to do any type of special filtering or any type of other analysis like you would with the sphericals. And then I'll say there are three primary solutions. I have them ordered here in the order that they were first published. Um, and they're all extremely similar. These three centers work together to make sure that uh, if one of them is showing something different in their solution, the centers understand why, and they uh, try and chase down which center has it correct, essentially. Uh, and so there's this nice uh, collaborative effort between these um, three different solutions, even though, uh, importantly, they use different software to solve it. They use different assumptions. They use different regularizations and so on. Putting all this together, you can then look at the contributors to ocean mass change. Uh, and so this is a plot actually from Matt Rodell's paper he, he uh, in 2018. He was actually focused more on hydrology, but it, it uh, really is showing all of the trends in the GRACE time series um, up through the end of the GRACE mission. So this plot doesn't include any GRACE follow-on. But as you can see, kind of all the red spots are the places that are losing uh, mass, either in the form of ice melt or in the form of drought. Uh, and so the Gulf of Alaska shows up, the Canadian archipelago, Greenland, uh, Patagonia, the Caspian Sea, High Mountain Asia, um, and Antarctica, obviously. Um, and so all these contributors then become important pieces to try and look at and understand. Now, when we do that, we can uh, come up with a total curve for uh, for mass gain in the oceans from GRACE. And we can do it two different ways. Here in blue, we can actually just directly compute the total mass gain over the oceans. So we used a mass con solution for this. We looked at the ocean mass cons themselves and just added them up. That gives us this curve. But if you also compute all of the individual components, so Greenland, uh, Antarctica, Gulf of Alaska, the Canadian Archipelago, the Caspian Sea, and then kind of just all the residual mountain glaciers and hydrology signals, you actually end up with very good agreement. Um, and that makes sense because the total gravity field should be kind of self-consistent with one another. Uh, and so we end up with a, a about 2.3 millimeters per year as our total uh, ocean sea level rise due to mass increases from these various contributing factors. All right, which then brings us to the final piece, and that's the ocean density with Argo. And Argo is a mission that measures temperature and salinity profiles of the global oceans. So to give you a really brief idea of this, um, the Argo mission is essentially a whole suite of floats that are thrown off of boats into the ocean and allowed to free float. Over here on the right, you'll see a map that's slowly filling in. That's showing you the spatial coverage of all the different Argo floats over time. And you'll see we're now in 2007. We're already getting really great density. Um, but by about the beginning of 2005, these floats had pretty much achieved uh, a good spatial coverage over the oceans. The floats come along, they drift, they descend uh, into the ocean, and then they take temperature and salinity profiles throughout the ocean come back up to the surface and transmit those salinity and temperature profiles along with their location to a satellite, which then sends it to the Argo data system. And you end up with temperature and salinity profiles typically down to 2000 meters. It does this every some amount of days and then it repeats the cycle and just does this indefinitely. These are free floating, but uh, you know they are quite well covered across the oceans. And so when you go from one day to the next, you end up with maps that look kind of like this, where the actual coverage of the floats might vary from one day to the next. So this is actually a map from yesterday. Yesterday, there were 3,894 floats that were operational in the Argo network. Uh, here's a picture of one of those floats being thrown off of a boat. Uh, and you can see that it has quite good coverage, although there are you know, maybe a few small gaps in the coverage including noteworthy, I'll say uh, the Arctic. There's 
a lot of sea ice in the Arctic, which makes it hard for these floats to be able to really contribute much many times of year. And so typically they're located in these main parts of the ocean. All right, you can then look at how the global average ocean temperature anomaly has changed over time. Uh, and this is basically just a way of showing how the oceans are warming. The x-axis is time, the y-axis is the depth of that salinity and temperature profile. And you'll can, you can see that essentially for all depths, uh, as we go from 2004 uh, to today, temperature has gone up at all depths. Um, it hasn't gone up in exactly the same way. You can see in the shallow parts of water, temperature has gone up more than in the deep parts of water. Maybe that's what we would expect. Um, but across the board, the ocean is warming. If the ocean's warming, it must be expanding. And that's how we're then able to uh, infer something about the effect of this on global sea level. And so when we look at global steric sea level change, uh, here I have computed a plot beginning in 2004 um, of steric sea level as well as thermosteric sea level. Thermosteric sea level is essentially the sea level change due only to temperature. Um, and because we're averaging this globally, uh, the thermosteric sea level is roughly equal to the steric sea level. Salinity isn't going to have a very big effect on the total global measurements. It would only have effects more on uh, kind of regional scales. And you can see that from, let's say, 2005, beginning of 2005 to today, something like 20 millimeters of sea level rise have resulted from this steric uh, warming of the oceans. When we put that all together, we get the sea level budget. Uh, and over the course of the last, say, 15 years, this budget has been both in and out of balance. And you can kind of summarize the sea level budget really simply with this plot. The sea level budget, at its most core, is the altimetry that we talked about at the beginning compared against the combination of the mass from Grace in blue and the steric from Argo in red. When you take blue and red together, this purple curve here is what you get for the combination. And when you look at it over the period from 2005 to 2022, you can begin to look at some of the similarities and differences in these curves. Now you notice right away, there seems to be pretty good agreement for a long period of time, with maybe the exception of the uh, 2011 La Nina period. But then here in this gap, between the GRACE and GRACE follow-on missions, something has happened that as a result, in the GRACE follow-on timeframe, we start to see some divergence here. So we wanna look at that a little closer. If we look at the period uh, beginning in 2005 when Argo had really reached really good coverage and ending at the end of the GRACE mission, we can look at the curves from altimetry and GRACE plus steric, and we see that they are very, very similar. They're not quite exactly the same, but these two agree within uh, within the uncertainties of the data sets. Now, like I said, there might be something to look into here with the 2011 La Nina, see if there's maybe a sampling problem that is going on, why we would get a difference here. Um, perhaps we might have expected either Argo or Grace to measure more of a dip than it did. Um, but we're pretty happy with this, and we would generally say that this is closure. However, when GRACE follow-on launched in uh, mid-2018 and then to the present day, we haven't seen the same thing. And if you compute these trends, for altimetry, you get still more than three millimeters per year. But when you look at GRACE and steric combined, we're now at only about two millimeters per year. And why these things have diverged is a big open question. Now, one thing that's interesting to note is that if you only looked at maybe the last two or three years, you might say that this is simply just a shift in the data set. But in fact, when you look at the full four and a half years of data for the GRACE mission, uh, this is not just a shift. This is actually a difference in trend. And so there have been a lot of different people who have looked at this and a lot of different suggested causes. Um, all three instruments have been blamed. <laughs> uh, so one suggestion was that maybe it was a bias in JSON 3 or perhaps more specifically, uh, an issue with the wet troposphere correction. There was also a suggestion that perhaps GRACE follow-on has a problem, and we'll get into that in a second. 
Um, and also maybe there's something wrong with Argo. But it could be something else entirely. This could be a glacial isostatic adjustment problem. This could be a geocenter issue. There might be mismatches in the domains, or it could be something else. And so uh, before we get into each of these different ideas, first, I just want to say this problem of closure and misclosure is pretty much a story as old as these, as these missions. Throughout the GRACE era, misclosure was noted, uh, and then updates were done, things were found, fixes were implemented, and closure was reachieved. And so there have been a lot of studies who have worked to ensure that this budget is closed. Back in 2009, Louillette uh, determined that the sum of the steric sea level and the ocean mass component, so Argo plus Grace, has a trend in agreement with the total sea level rise from altimetry with 95% confidence interval. So way back, just uh, four years after the Argo mission had achieved uh, you know, full global coverage, we already were looking at this and already thinking that we were in good agreement. Fast forward about a decade in 2017, Chambers et al. Uh, said that for the period of 2005 to 2014, they again found closure in these for both the long-term trend and for the month-to-month, -month, which was important. But as we've continued moving forward, different groups have pointed out the misclosure that I showed a second ago and other misclosures over time and pointed to different things that might be causing it. So in 2018, Chen et al., which is where this uh, figure over here came from, said that grace mass estimates uh, are sensitive to geocenter, J2, GIA, and leakage. Um, and when you look at this plot over here, kind of the key to look at is that this blue line does not seem to overlay any of the other lines. The blue line is if you take the altimetry measurement and subtract from it Argo, that should be the equivalent of grace. And as you can see in this paper, it was not. Um, now, one thing I'll note is that this leakage component has uh, a much bigger impact with the spherical harmonic solutions that I talked about earlier. Spherical harmonics, and I, I don't have a good plot here on hand for it, but have a problem where as you go from land to ocean, and especially in the places where the trends and signals are really big, like Greenland, uh, the, the mass anomaly of the Greenland ice sheet melting gets smeared out onto the ocean. And so if you aren't properly accounting for that, you might think that there is a mass loss over the ocean when in fact that's actually signal from Greenland. With the mass con solutions that we talked about, we're actually able to build in things into the regularization constraints to try and take care of a lot of these leakage problems. And so that was one of the ways that we helped to close this problem is uh, by shifting away from these solutions that have a lot of leakage and moving towards solutions that uh, don't have as much leakage. Fast forward again, a couple of years ago, Horath et al. Uh, said that the sea level budgets are closed for the period of January 2003 to August 2016, essentially the GRACE mission. But what was also embedded in this is that after the GRACE mission, the sea level budget is not closed, as we showed earlier. Kim et al. the next year pointed out that GIA and geocenter mismodeling do contaminate grace and grace follow-on, and perhaps they might be a cause. And Barnoud et al. earlier this year said that after correcting for the wet tropospheric drift, uh, and so this was one of the things that was pointed out with Jason 3 might be a problem. After they corrected for that problem, there was still misclosure. And so it had reduced the misclosure, but the misclosure was still significant. What was also interesting with this paper is they also said they don't think it's a grace or a grace follow-on problem, that those data sets are unlikely to be responsible. And so this has always been a question. This has been the, the story of these missions of why, uh, when they don't agree, are they not agreeing? And then how do we get them to agree? And why does that not necessarily hold true moving forward into the future? With the current misclosure, there are questions like, could it be the altimetry? And uh, I'll show here that the tide gauge comparisons that we do with altimetry would suggest that that's not the case. So to give you an idea of what these comparisons look like, this is a map of the trend in the altimetry over the oceans. And you might be able to see a bunch of little dots. You can see kind of a lot of them here in Southeast Asia, but also all along the US coastline, uh, all up here in Europe and Africa. 
And essentially, uh, various centers will do a comparison between what the altimetry is showing over the oceans and what a subset of these uh, various tide gauges are showing. And so they typically choose a subset, maybe on the order of 60 or 70 of these tide gauges. These are tide gauges that have long histories of being highly reliable. They have good geodetic measurements in order to make sure that we have all of the processes taken care of. Um, and essentially, when we take the uh, time series from these tide gauges and compare it to the time series from altimetry, we can subtract the two and look at what type of residual signal is there. That's what's then in this bottom plot here, the difference between the background altimetry measurement and what's measured by these tide gauges. And you'll see that while there are differences, there is no trend difference. Uh, and this is for the period from 93 to 2023, so to today. Um, and uh, that would seem to suggest that while there might be some things to investigate with the altimetry, it would not be the leading cause and why we're seeing this trend uh, change with the GRACE follow-on timeframe of the sea level budget. I'll also point out that the ocean surface topography science team is routinely doing these kind of checks. And so, for example, uh, Brian Beckley in 2017 pointed out that there was this internal calibration mode range correction that had been going on for years in the, in the TOPEX side A instrument. Uh, and it created this kind of U-shaped um, altimeter drift that was then corrected for. Now, when you then do the same tide gauge comparison that we showed on the last plot, and you looked at what that correction did, instead of having a nice line all the way across for the tide gauges, you ended up with this U-shaped drift that resulted from the tide gauges uh, not matching the altimetry. There was a different data set from JPL that didn't use that correction, and its comparison looked more like this, which then led to the suggestion that we shouldn't be doing that uh, internal calibration mode range correction. And the time series for altimetry then uh, during the TOPEX side A portion of the mission changed from this blue line here to, sorry, to uh, one of these other suggested alternatives, either red or light blue here. You can see that it had the effect of having a, a smaller trend during the TOPEX side A portion of the satellite record. Um, and as a result, it uh, yielded a slightly larger acceleration uh, in sea level rise over the entire 30 year time frame. That then brings some questions. Well, could it be Grace follow on? And it's important to note that one of the two GRACE follow-on satellites has a non-operational accelerometer. Uh, as we talked about, the accelerometer is used for trying to account for the, the non-gravitational forces. Um, and so if we want to account for non-gravitational forces on the satellite with the broken accelerometer, uh, the way that they have been doing that is to use a transplant where they say, okay, the two satellites are roughly seeing the same atmosphere and the same solar. And so we can move the one accelerometer measurement over to the other uh, satellite and use that to correct the satellite. There could be an issue with this, and this has continued to be iterated on, but this doesn't seem to be something that would explain a bias or trend difference that we're seeing in the signal. The other thing is that given Grace's observation type, it just doesn't seem very likely that the instrument would cause a bias like we're seeing at all. Um, and to further kind of suggest that maybe GRACE follow-on isn't the problem, we have compared with uh, satellite laser ranging. I guess SLR has two different meanings in this talk. Uh, satellite laser ranging for low degree um, gravity fields that we can get uh, by essentially shining a laser at um, spherical satellites that are in orbit to learn things like J2 and C30 and some of the other low degree harmonics. And compare that to GRACE and we're not seeing any evidence that there's an issue with GRACE follow-on in this regard. Um, the last thing we can do is we can compare between the different centers to make sure all the different centers are getting similar solutions. And the GRACE follow-on science data system team does this regularly with the spherical harmonic solutions and the MASCON solutions. And so just shown here, uh, if we wanted to say that maybe my GRACE curve was wrong, we could go grab a different solution and 
while there are differences in these two plots, they're not differences in terms of the trend. It's just month to month variability that we're seeing. That then brings the question, well, maybe it's Argo. And uh, we will rightfully point out that there have been concerns about salinity measurements in Argo in recent years. So of these four plots, it breaks down the different components, altimeter, grace, um, and the Argo thermosteric data, and then the Argo halo, uh, halo steric data. So this is the salinity portion of steric sea level. And you'll notice that for all but this green line, the steric sea level uh, is dropping significantly. Well, the only thing that could cause that is if there was a density increase in the oceans. Uh, 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 sorry, a salinity increase in the oceans. Um, and that's not really intuitive. When we're talking about maybe regional areas, you might see changes in the salinity like this. But when you're talking about the global curve, there wouldn't really be something that could explain a big uh, uh, change in the halosteric data like this. Now, the green curve is a slightly different curve. This is from Scripps uh, Institute of Oceanography at uh, UCSD. And this is the curve that I used when I was plotting Argo earlier. Um, and it doesn't show that problem. They use some slightly different processing techniques and they have a much more stable halosteric curve. Uh, and so that tends to suggest that uh, this is probably the Argo data set to use. Um, getting back to what we talked about before, ultimately, when you're talking about global sea level rise, it doesn't really matter. You could just use thermosteric sea level, and it should be roughly the equivalent. Um, on a regional scale, you do see differences in the trends. You see it most noteworthy over the North Atlantic, uh, that the thermosteric sea level has much kind of larger hot and cool spots. Um, but when you average those globally, you get something like this that, you know, just has a little bit of variability throughout the years, but uh, well, it, it is not something that could explain this divergence in the grace follow on time frame. There's the suggestion, maybe it's GIA um, and GIA would have a large effect on grace follow on, but GIA is linear and we're seeing a divergence that is a nonlinear divergence. And so while there may be mismodeling due to GIA, that could not be the only culprit in why we're seeing this trend difference. Uh, it would have to be coupled with something else. So then there's a question of, well, are we even looking at the same thing? When you look at the Argo mass uh, in yellow here on this map are the places where generally you have Argo float data. As we showed in that, uh, in that video early on with Argo, this mask changes over time. And earlier on in the time series, there were more holes in it. But generally, this is a pretty good mask. If you mask the altimetry measurements with that, all of the places in dark blue would have to get thrown away. And so that should have an effect on your time series. With Grace, uh, all in yellow here would be the ocean parts of Grace, and same thing. You would want to mask out all of the Argo places and compute an ocean time series for only the places where all three of these data sets overlap. And that's something that we've been working in our lab on implementing, but uh, you know, our early results basically show that this isn't making much of a difference at all. It's not closing the problem. Uh, it is giving us better comfort in the fact that you know, that's just one more thing that we're handling correctly, but uh, but we're still seeing this divergence. So then perhaps it has to do with C20 or GeoCenter. And way back in 2011, Nierman War showed that uh, C20 is, uh, is highly dependent on Greenland and Antarctic mass loss. Um, turns out that there was a lot more to it than that. Uh, but as we have continue to evolve our understanding over time, we still have this general dependence that you can kind of get a good prediction of C20 if you account for all the right terms. Similarly, um, GRACE and GRACE follow-on don't observe changes in the geocenter at all. Uh, so satellites orbit a body's center of mass, and since GRACE is observing changes in the mass, it can't see that the geocenter is changing itself. Uh, it can only see everything above those terms, so degree two and higher. Um, and so instead, geocenter motion typically gets estimated from the degree two and higher estimates of mass loss, uh, which essentially involves estimating the mass loss from the glaciers and the land, 
and then putting them into the oceans using sea level fingerprints. And from that, figuring out what would the combined effect on degree one be. Um, and it's possible that this latest method of doing it, which is a vast improvement over the past, and you kind of see the changes in time here of the methods, it's possible there's still something to be added to this method. So there could still be some outstanding issues. Which then kind of brings us to where do we go from here? Um, and I'll, I'll just kind of close out by saying that this is a problem that Ocean Surface Topography Science Team, Grace Follow-On, Argo, um, all continue to look at, continue to monitor, and continue to work with each other on. Constantly checking for instrument drifts, problems with the background models, and so on, and constantly doing comprehensive multi-platform studies. Um, over here on the right uh, is just kind of the last figure I'll show. And this is just different ways of looking at the discrepancies. Uh, this was for uh, Fang and Zong 2015. Um, here, if you want to look at it in terms of the total altimetry, the differences. Here, if you want to look at it in terms of the mass loss, the differences. And if you want to look at it in terms of the steric loss, the differences. You can see there are definitely differences. And perhaps there's something in these regional estimates that would explain uh, why we're getting these divergences. Maybe there's one region that we're not observing as well as another. Um, or perhaps there's something like a, an ENSO tie to this whole problem that could help explain it as well. So these are things that continue to be looked at um, and, uh, and really focused on. And so with that, I'll just kind of uh, finish by saying, since it's an open question, we're always looking for new, uh, new ways of looking at this problem. And perhaps uh, somebody on the call might have an idea for how we might be able to solve this misclosure. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mike. Very interesting. Um, let's see, we have a question from Gavin in the chat. Yeah, let me see if I can pull the chat up. Okay, I do. All right, so Gavin asked, are there potential climate signals in things that we assumed constant, like the sea state? Um, uh, yes. So going back to, let me see if I can find that slide. Going back to this slide here. Um, yes, we're using a, we're using a model to account for C-state bias, as well as all these other things. Uh, and there could be issues with these models. Um, matter of fact, the most recent update to the uh, altimetry portion of this equation was in the wet troposphere. Um, there was a, a noted drift in the instrument that measured wet troposphere on JSON-3. Um, and uh, while correcting that drift did help close some of the misclosure, uh, it did not completely close it. Um, and so, yes, con continuing to look at all of these different pieces uh, it remains an ongoing an ongoing piece of what the ocean surface topography science team can bring to the table for solving this this misclosure. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? Or... All right, we've got a follow up question there. So, is there a role for climate modeling to help? Um, yes, I think so. So. The um, the place that I most recently was reading a paper in climate modeling, trying to bring in information, was actually uh, looking at the ocean temperature and salinity um, using ocean models to see where Argo may be either um, either mismeasuring or missing uh, pieces of the puzzle, um, and. I think that that would then apply across the board. I think climate modeling could be used, and uh, you know, for instance, with with Grace, we're constantly comparing Grace results to uh, results from models and results from uh, laser altimeters over the ice sheets, and results from um, you know all of the different assimilation systems um, to try and ensure that each of the different components in the Grace portion of this budget uh, are accurate and that 
we we're not misaccounting for something. I think that that applies across the board. Uh, and and I I you know know that there have been efforts in all three missions to use the models to uh, make sure that we're on the right track for what we're measuring with each mission and help and help fix when we're not. Looking at the Southern Ocean, we have changes in fresh water from floating and grounded ice, as well as shifts in the winds, anything there. Um, yeah, so now you're really stretching the limits of my knowledge, and I'm going to caveat this by saying I don't know the definitive answer to that question. Um, but, uh, but yes, that would be something that is worth looking into and almost certainly has people looking at it, um, either, either at JPL or in France or at one of the other various centers. Um, but yes, changes in the freshwater, uh, would affect the steric portion. Um, I also recently saw a paper that perhaps suggested that, uh, that sea ice might not quite be as negligible uh, in the mass component as what we have always assumed it to be. Um, so there, the, the idea basically being that same as a, a glass of water, if you put an ice cube in a glass of water and then you let it melt, it doesn't raise or lower the, the level of the water. Um, and so it shouldn't have an effect on the mass. But uh, this paper was actually suggesting that maybe it's a little more involved than that. Um, and so, yes, I don't think that uh, that we can just say, oh, the water is the ice is floating uh, or is is grounded ice and it's not a problem. I think it I think it could could certainly be a source of um, some of the error that we're seeing on the flip side. What I will also say is and let me go find this slide. What I'll also say is that as we move towards this cohesive mask across all of the data sets, um, the altimeter mission is not able to get good measurements over that uh, those ice uh, over the oceans. And so the, the cohesive mask between the three would be masking that out altogether. And so in theory, it shouldn't be coming into the calculation at all. Big caveat there also is that Grace's 300 kilometer resolution um, means that there's still a bit of smearing. And so how you exactly match that mask when you've got 300 kilometer resolution on on a ice sheet is, is an interesting question. Yeah, and then this this point about the Arctic as a hotspot in sea level trends. Um, doesn't get included in Argo or altimeter. Yes, in Grace we see that as well. Um, the the limited ability that we can do to compare this. So, with Grace we can compute the ocean mass portion uh, with and without the Arctic, and it it just doesn't have much of an effect uh, from the ocean mass perspective. Um, Argo and altimeters are not going to be measuring the steric portion at all. And so if we're confident that the mass portion uh, doesn't have a big effect on GMSL, then we would think that that shouldn't have a big effect uh, on anything else. However, the, the correct way to really boil this down is to start looking at these on a region by region basis where we can and avoid the regions altogether where we can't. Okay, are there any other questions, comments? Well, we're a little past the hour, so I guess we could wrap up there. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciated this. This was a, a good exercise for me to try and put all this together in one place as well. So I appreciate having the chance to give this talk. Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs>